The governor begins an unprecedented fourth term with ambitious goals for environment and higher education. The La Jolla football player's head injury causes finger pointing and concern over how to protect young athletes. And corruption charges envelop Calexico's police department as a new chief from L.A. arrives to clean house. I'm Mark Sauer, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are Gene Cubison, political reporter for NBC7 San Diego. Hi, Gene. Hi, Mark. Thanks for thinking of Good me. Good to see you back. Voice of San Diego education reporter Mario Coran. Hi, Mario. Hi, Mark. Good to see you today. And Fronteras reporter Jill Repligal of KPBS News. Hi, Jill. Hi, great and to be here. And it's going to be Jill's last day with us. Unfortunately, she's taking a good job down in Costa Rica. <laughs> Well, before we get to today's uh, segments, an international story, the tragic shooting at a Paris newspaper dominated the news this week, a story that's still unfolding. I want to start by briefly asking our panel here if this mass slaying of journalists, cartoonists, editors there, if that would uh, cause us as journalists or publications to self-censor uh, for fear and safety issues. Well, I would imagine there's going to be some, some cautionary due diligence in terms of um, deciding or assessing when you might be inflammatory, needlessly provocative, when you haven't squared up the facts and, and things like that. If, if you're going to dispense truth and, and take those kinds of risks, it better be, uh, it better be on the mark. Mm -hmm. and, well, Jill, and these were, of course, cartoonists. This was a satirical publication. It's what they do. Right. Yeah. I, I don't really think so. I mean, we've seen violence erupt from provocative journalism and cartoons in the past, mm -hmm. and um, those who do it are probably going to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And Mario, you work for a, an alternative publication. Uh, you certainly don't shy away from stories that are tough, usually local angles and all. Um, do you think self-censoring might be in the future there? Well, I think it's only natural to, to go through the potential consequences of, of what may come from a story. But I think to shy away from that and to censor yourself because, it's the, because of the consequences, I think is... Uh, uh, sort of a slight to what your, you know, your main your job, issue is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. And of course, that story is still unfolding and KPBS will be following it through the day. The governor's inauguration was certainly historic. It was 40 years ago this month that Jerry Brown was first inaugurated as California's governor. He may be in his late 70s now, but he's as ambitious as ever. And this year, with a balanced budget and much improved economy, he's launched his fourth term with plans to tackle climate change and infrastructure and give college students and their parents a break. So, uh, Gene, uh, Governor Brown seems to be ahead so far on uh, climate change, at least from national leaders, certainly conservative leaders in Washington. I did want to start with a clip here and hear what he had to say on climate change. Increase from one-third to 50 percent our electricity derived from renewable sources. <laughs> Two, and even more difficult, reduce today's petroleum use in cars and trucks by up to 50 percent. Three, double the efficiency of existing buildings and make heating fuels cleaner. All right, let's take that middle one there. We're going to cut our gas use by 50 percent. We've got electric cars. They're big in the state, but they're still a tiny fraction. That does, as he notes, uh, seem very difficult. Well, it is ambitious. Um, he's always been a visionary. Um, he fancies himself as a, a prophet without, any, his own land, without honor in his own land and time. And he's going to be aggressive uh, despite uh, the criticism here. Now, when you're just talking about the, the, the gas use, um, obviously there, it would seem to me that he's going to go with a carrot and stick approach. And, and one of the things that I think is, is going to be is, is there will be incentives for ride sharing, mass transit use, uh, more walkability, uh, more bikeability. Um, things, cars, th th and, and things that would reduce the vehicle miles of travel. I, I know there's a paradigm that's coming in terms of gas taxation at the federal and state levels is where you don't charge cents per gallon but on vehicle miles traveled mm -hmm. and that is really a sacred cow because the long-haul truckers, people that need to do, put a lot of rubber on the road, 
um, you know, to maintain the businesses are going, oh, wait just a minute, and the taxers are going, yeah, but you're using the roads to a greater extent. You need to pay more of the right. maintenance and upgrade costs. Okay. So we're going to probably see things like that. Also, uh, the mix of the fuels and... Uh, well, not everybody's happy about this either, though. Oh, no. He's going to certainly have his, his opponents, I would think, starting with the people who refine oil into gasoline. Well, yeah, not only the petrochemical, but uh, um, all sorts of uh, businesses and industries, broad scale, that depend on long-haul trucking. Um, uh, certainly he's going to try and tell them or sell them on the idea that, um, that this isn't going to hurt them too much, but as, as you expand out to the whole uh, climate change uh, address here, it's, uh, it, they're, they're saying, look, it, it's too much too soon to make us the guinea pig. The rest of the world is not coming to the table mm -hmm. with their adjustments, and we're going, to be, we're going to be behind the curve, and maybe instead of this we go to some kind of carbon tax thing with, with tariffs, but, but why should we be the guinea pigs to see mm -hmm. if this is going to work? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to hurt ourselves, our customers uh, at, the, at the back end. And the governor's not buying it. Well, Joe, we've had cheap, we've had ex very expensive gas in recent times, and of course we've seen a drastic reduction here lately. Would folks be that upset if you tacked down, I don't know, 25 cents, 50 cents, and said we're going to pump it into alternative fuels and making buildings more efficient and all these other things the governor's talking about? I think about. it all depends on the price, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's been, yeah, it's just really thrown kind of calculations out of whack the last three or four months that the prices have been so low. Yeah, and we've gone from north, know, way north of four bucks a gallon down into the 250, 60 range. Right, right. yeah. I mean, I just bought a Prius a while ago, and I'm like, well, maybe I didn't really need to spend all that money. <laughs> you know, gas got cheaper, so I, mean, I just really think it depends on the price. Right. right. Now, San Diego had uh, leaders here passed a, a climate pan plan recently, too, and of course, some of the critics are saying, oh, you know, you're just one city here, and we breathe the air, of course, universally around the globe here. California different story with as huge as that is. But does San Diego's plan dovetail nicely into what the governor's trying to do? Yeah, there, there's a lot of carryover. I, I, I see a certain amount of synergism in the fact that if you go with these smart growth strategies, essentially these vertical gentrification and developments, um, uh, accelerating mass transit along corridors that lead to both housing and employment centers, um, once again, the bikeability, the walkability aspect of this, and then of course mass transit, the, uh, the, the incentives that can come from the state, and, and this is going to morph into the, uh, to the discussion about the bullet train, high-speed rail. Um, so they're all part and parcel of this, this argument that uh, is becoming very ideological. And I want to get into some details in a moment about the high-speed rail, but let's shift to one other high point of the speech, and it also doubled as his State of the State address, talk about efficiency. Uh, he made an important point about the affordability of college education. Here's a clip on that. California is blessed with a rich and diverse system. Its many elements serve a vast diversity of talents and interests. While excellence is their business, affordability and timely completion is their imperative. And as I've said before, I'll not make the students of California the default financiers of our colleges and universities. So he's butting heads with uh, Janet Napolitano, the head of the UC trustees, on, on this one. Um, no uh, details, though, on how he's going to do this. That's Sorry. the question, yeah. <laughs> these, these wonderful broad speeches, but the, the devil's in the details. Well, he's a product of the UC system, and um, certainly his, uh, his father helped promote it. As a matter of fact, I recall when his sister Kathleen Brown was a state treasurer running against Pete Wilson for governor unsuccessfully, that, that she revealed that, that he, in diversifying and expanding the state system back then and, and bringing more affordability uh, to students, put campuses in San Diego and Santa Cruz and Orange Counties with a specific goal in mind, or at least maybe it was a hidden agenda, of taking into these Republican strongholds, essentially, economic engines that brought progressive faculties, staffs, and students. This is before students could vote uh, at the age of 18, but knowing that somehow they would uh, become more blue state in orientation, and certainly we've seen that happen here at UCSC, uh, UCSD and uh, Cal Irvine. So uh, he is, he's on, in favor of that. He, uh, he had graduated from Berkeley by the time the free speech movement came about, but he is invested in this, and he still wants this to be a cornerstone of legacy for the Brown family, not just himself. Well, Mario, you cover education, of course, as a parent of two kids who graduated from UC. The costs went up and up and up when we were trying to cover those. Uh, they can't keep going that way. It's got to become affordable somehow. Does he have any specific ideas here? I, know I see the president the other day said, let's make community college, those two-year programs, free for everybody. Maybe Brown would sign on to that. 
You know, I don't know enough about uh, Brown's plan to to talk about how realistic those those ideas are. I do know that it's a serious concern for for parents. I mean, the parents that I've spoken with would consider sending their kids out of state as soon as, or, or they would consider sending their kids out of state a more realistic option than a mm -hmm. UC school, even though they'd want their kids to stay close even, to home. Obviously. Even paying out out of, out of ta state tuition. Right. All right, we got a couple of seconds left in this segment. The bullet train we mentioned, even the governor kind of joked the other day that, uh, well, I uh, didn't know where the money was going to come from. Kind of still don't, but uh, we're going to get the money. Are we going to get the money? It's $68 billion. Some people say it's going to be a lot more than that. Well, if he's depending on uh, federal kick-ins, uh, this Congress is not going to be that source. Um, this, this may be a bridge too far. It started out as a $10 billion project. Then in roughly 2013, 2014, Fourteen dollars. It's sixty-eight billion. It may go to a hundred. There is a lot of pushback along the way, and there is going to be a lot of re-education before you get to that. His father helped uh, pioneer the uh, the California Water Project, and this was at a time when Eisenhower was bringing in the state high or the federal highway system. Mm -hmm. So he has kind of bought into those uh, infrastructure paradigms. But a whole different time. But, now. but a whole different time now yeah. with the twin tunnels, the bullet right. train. It's it could right. be just uh, pipe dreams. All right. I'm nervous about that one because of the time frame. You know, yeah. was it 2029 supposed to be completed? That's a long time yeah. from now, and technology is moving so fast. Yeah. And to keep people interested to any point to have the support for it. Well, we do need to move on now. It is a tragic story that's unfortunately become all too common. A concussion during a high school football game has long-term consequences. A player at La Jolla High is home from school trying to recover from the effects of a blow to the head in a game last fall. And fingers are being pointed all around. Amaro, the junior varsity player, you call him Blake in this story here. Sure. Um, Start by telling us uh, some details of the game. What what happened? This was a player who was on the field a lot. He played offense, defense, special teams. <clears throat> sure. So as you say, uh, we declined to, or we honored the family's request to keep his name out of the story. Um, but we call him Blake for the story. Uh, he was playing in a junior varsity game. He was playing offense, defense, special teams. So he was on the field for, for every snap, which is what I understand. Um, we do know that he was injured at some point during the game. Now it's being disputed what exactly happened. But what his father says is is this, that he was his son was injured early in the game, uh, was on the sidelines vomiting, throwing up, which are signs of a concussion, possible concussion. Um, he had gone to a coach, an assistant coach, and asked the coach to let him sit out a play. Uh, I think it was a kickoff. He'd asked not to, not to go in for that. The coach refused to let him sit, um, so he stayed in the game uh, throughout. And when he finally came out in his own accord late in the game, he was badly, badly injured, and the athletic trainer assessed him at that point, uh, perhaps too late, uh, and sent him to the hospital, and he's, he's recovering, he's as you say. Dazed and injured. Right. Well, and again, we should be clear that uh, on, that's where the gray area comes in in this story where he said he requested this. This is uh, Blake and his family's uh, version of events. And then you interviewed, of course, the, uh, the uh, assistant coach there who was involved on the sidelines for that junior varsity team. Tell us what happened uh, in, yeah, in so his account. Yeah, it, so it was, it was like pulling teeth to try to get uh, an accurate account of what happened or any comment from the school. So the school didn't uh, They're not forthcoming on this. They they weren't trans at least they weren't open with me or mm -hmm. or, or forthcoming with me, um, so they weren't talking. The assist or the the head varsity coach when I initially called them to to ask him, hey, did this happen? This is the story I heard from a parent. Uh, he just flat out told me that it it never happened. That I must be talking about a different program. Didn't happen on my. In my didn't happen on my team, right? So. Uh, I got some more details, called them the next day and say, look, I think this happened. I have these new details. And he said, all right, it happened, but okay. I thought you were talking about the uh, varsity team. Yeah, which to I be mean, clear, he's in charge of the varsity and, and by definition, the umbrella, the in charge of the JV, the whole program, football there at sure, the Hoyt sure. School. Sure, Maybe it was a misunderstanding, but that's just an example of how it was sort of tough to sort out what happened and who knew what, and right. which is, I think, what the school district and the school are trying to do right now before they assign blame, at least in an official capacity. So to, be, to be clear, is there a lawsuit? Is the family sued or is there no, no legal suit pending or they're trying to work with the school still? Um, I, I don't know. You're I, not aware of a lawsuit. I, I mean, point. I spoke with the, the father after the story um, just to get his, his read on it, his mm -hmm. take on it, um, but I didn't at that time get any sense whether they are, they are going to sue, but that's a interesting possibility. Yeah. Would they have to start with a claim, do, though? Yeah, they do. Administrative claim yeah, to be rejected it's a within a statutory time of 45 right. days or something. Right. So apparently that hasn't happened. That, but it's, it's 
it's down the road there possibly. But, but Joe? they've been su supportive, right? It sounded like from your reporting that the family's been supportive of the school and... And I vice versa, from, yeah. from what I hear. I mean, and that was an interesting component to this is that the father and from what I understand, the son is still loyal to this team. You know, when the high school football coach is, is to those that play football or maybe you, you knew people that played football, the high school football coach is like a father figure, right? And so there was still that closeness that they didn't want to violate. They didn't want to violate that trust. Right. Uh, at the same time, his father wants to make sure that steps are taken so this doesn't happen again to another player. Well, let's talk about that. This, these concussions from the high school level, probably even down to the Pop Warner level through college, through the pro ranks here, have been in the news. They've, they've been a, a big debate in our culture and our society now. Now, California, and your, your story touched on this, has protocols. Uh, first of all, these coaches are supposed to be trained to look at what might be a symptom of a head injury, right? Correct. So all these protocols that were in place, one of them is that coaches are trained, they have a uh, a training in how to recognize and how to respond to possible concussions on the field. As you noted, vomiting might be a... Right, vomiting might, might be one of those signs. Might be so, a, a symptom. And uh, at this school, uh, if, if uh, at La Jolla, uh, seven, there's a seven-day protocol in place where if a kid is injured or possibly injured, that player has to stay out seven days before he's, a, he's seen by a, 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 medical, a licensed medical practitioner, gets written clearance to go back in the game. So that was already in place at La Jolla and it's going to be in place district-wide next year. Um, but those were already in place when this happened. Yeah. So, so the question is, were they followed a lot of great stuff? Heat of the moment on the sidelines there. What happened? You know, who really knows sitting in the stands? How much can you see? What were the conversations like? And this would be the case with head injuries in any of these football games, I would think. Exactly. I mean, how... It, so right now we're trying to sort through exactly what happened, which, is, which I think is important to do to see how we could possibly prevent it again. Right. When the details come out and everything's on the table, perhaps we have to look at the fact that maybe we just can't prevent something like this. Right. Or at least that's a question we have to ask ourselves. All right, I did want to, we got a few seconds left. I wanted to do one step back question here. Of course, we're in the midst of the big uh, uh, NFL uh, playoff season, the Super Bowl's looming here, and uh, everybody's excited who's a football fan now. But does this, uh, is the game in the long run? Are fewer kids going to be playing high school football? Are, uh, are, you know, these lawsuits and these settlements with the NFL and Kyle and the NCAA, is this going to put a big stain? Is the future of football in, in doubt here? because of these terrible injuries? Well, it's such a big juggernaut now, it's hard to imagine that it's going to stain it uh, to such that it will put an end to it. But yes, we're already seeing the figures that the, uh, and the polls that it, it is trending downward as a, as a desirable sport for the kids to get into, um, if, 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 as has boxing over the years. Um, eventually, you look at the orthopedic and the, uh, and, uh, the neurological right. downsides of a sport, um, there's a lot of money in golf. There's a lot of money in tennis. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sheer, yeah, the, it's the sheer total yeah. of yeah, of and, the and that's yeah. And when you've got the president right. of the United States saying, "If I had a uh, if I had a boy, he wouldn't be playing right. football." Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's really parents that drive yeah. that oh, initial yeah. Yeah. sort of love exactly. of sports. But it seems to me like what's missing in, in so many of these cases is somebody, an independent somebody, you know, who's really looking out for the kids yeah. and because. You know, I'll, like in, in, in this situation, everyone's kind of on the same side, you know. The kid wants to play. Right. He's, you There's know, that whole he, culture he wants to be suck good, it up and get in there. Right? Exactly. And, yeah. and so you, you really need, it seems like, a, somebody who's kind of right. really looking out and trying to be ultra cautious. Right. Well, we'll see. I'm sure you'll be following up <clears throat> and, and watch what happens in that particular case. We're going to uh, shift gears now. Calexico, a city of 39,000, the Imperial County Farm Belt, burst into the news last fall following a raid by the FBI. The agents targeted the city's police department. One cop has been fired, four were put on leave. And a big city veteran with a reputation for rooting out dirty cops has taken over as police chief. Joe, sounds like something out of a Hollywood script. And we've got this fella here from L.A. Let's listen to what the new chief, uh, Mr. Bostic, has to say about the situation there. I have an investigation unit, the former investigation unit, that was investigating no crimes, told me they had no narcotics investigations going on. They were also responsible for the internal affairs investigations, and they, had, they didn't know where any of those were. <clears throat> well, it turns out they weren't going on. They were putting them in desk drawers and putting them away and hiding them, hoping the statutes run. You know, I know how the game is played. Well... <laughs> What is the game being played out there? What's going on right now? <clears throat> we don't know all that much because, you know, the FBI won't say a lot. It's an ongoing investigation. But the chief has been very vocal about things that he's found at the department since he, he took over in October, I believe. Um, 
He has accused the leaders of the police union of running an extortion scandal uh, or extortion ring. They, Who are they extorting? Uh, city council members, oh, okay. allegedly. Uh, the city council is very divided in Calexico between those who support the police union and the former chief who was kicked out before Chief Boston came in and those who, who say you know, all along thought there problem. were things going yeah. wrong there. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, he found that the department had bought all this sort of high-tech surveillance equipment that he says is just not appropriate for a, a small place like Calexico. And then the FBI is looking through this and they're following city council members and trying to get them in compromising situations. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's part of it. That's what we do know. Uh, but, you know, rumors and, uh, you know, a few sort of things that have come out run the gamut from possible involvement with drug trafficking to, you know, just generally bullying citizens and, and other members of the police department. All right. We do have another clip from your feature on this on this story uh, about some more of the, uh, the serious allegations. Bostic also says leaders in the police department used around $100,000 in seized assets to purchase high-tech tools for breaking into cars and buildings. So I have all these tools and everything that have obviously been used because they're new but they're worn, and yet I have no search warrants. He says whatever they were doing with that equipment, it wasn't legal. They also bought James Bond-like surveillance equipment, like hidden eyeglass cameras. I literally cannot think of any legitimate reason why a department the size of Calexico would have that kind of equipment. And then when the FBI is going through that equipment and starts looking in the recording, they're recording city council members. And they're using it for extortion. I can say that. That's just true. Well, don't sugarcoat it, Chief. He is not pulling any punches. If no, he's he, if, not. If the is playing close to the fest, he certainly isn't. Right. Tell us about his background. Who is this guy? So he was an assistant police chief in the LAPD. Uh, he, he's been a cop for, I believe, three and a half decades. Mm -hmm. um, he was brought in after the Rodney King beating and, um, not, I mean, he was part of the department, but he was sort of part of the internal investigations team after the, the Rodney King beating and the Rampart corruption scandals. And so he's made a name for himself as kind of the cleanup guy. Yeah, so he signed that Rampart division was notorious up there. So he has seen his share of dirty cops and what they do and how they operate. So he seemed like a logical guy to come in here. And yeah, well, and what's interesting is he, he's been working for the private sector for a while now. He retired from the police department a while ago, and uh, he was very strongly wooed by the new city manager to come to Calexico, long way away from Los Angeles, you know, left his family um, to, to work on this project, okay. <laughs> this kind of cleanup project. Now, let's talk about the uh, police union, and what is their response? What do they say in, in, uh, in light of these allegations? They um, so they, they haven't responded directly to things like you know what were they doing with the the surveillance equipment, uh, but they say you know all these things. First of all, that the purchases that he referred to in that clip, um, you know, it's not like one guy in the department can make that decision. These were you know this was the, the supervisors that made that decision, and they say that's the totally legitimate things for them to have. Um, they're plan they plan to sue the the police chief for for defamation. They've already. Um, put in a claim for damages, and uh, they also plan to sue some of the city council members who have made comments in the past uh, disparaging the police officers' union. Wow. So you, we, this could all come out in court. Now, it's interesting, uh, Gene, with a lawsuit, you and I have been around a long time, and we've seen a lot of discovery and the lack of warrants, as the chief cited there. The Somebody's going to have to get on the stand and, and to talk under oath. Somebody's going to have to give depositions there. Uh, it's interesting, the idea of a lawsuit. Well, yeah, the, the power of the force of, uh, of uh, you know, the consequences of perjury are great. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, <laughs> given, you know, the diametrically opposing testimony here, or not testimony, mm -hmm. but at least assertions here, yeah. they were going to have to be testimony, the triers of fact, the jurors, um, assuming it, it goes to that without settlements, and there are criminal charges, it's, this is going to be... Uh, it, it's going to be one to watch. I, it's going to be a, a media feast, even even in Imperial County, which is not a, 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 a you know, a highly um, uh, news-covered place, but this is going to attract people from far and wide just because right. of the salacious details. Yeah, right. and the court is the place to uh, to vet them. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, Jill, you mentioned the previous chief was, was fired. What were the specifics regarding that uh, dismissal? We don't know exactly, but, the, uh, but Chief Bostic has... Basically, you know, he, he alluded to the fact that there was nothing, there were no investigations going on when he got there. You know, he basically says that the cops weren't doing anything. Um, so he says that the, the chief was inept and just, you know, wasn't, wasn't doing his job. He also 
talked about some sort of bizarre sounding internal restructuring that he did. He had, I think, the sergeants out patrolling and he put the lieutenants in charge. Um, some of the city council members who support Chief Bostic uh, said that the, the former police chief, um, Chief Tavadis, he was from the Imperial County Sheriff's Department, didn't have the qualifications uh, and he basically got that job because he was buddies with the police officers union and some of the city council members who at that time had the majority of the vote. All right, we've got a short time <laughs> left on this segment. Uh, you did interview some of the residents out there. What was the reaction from some of those folks in the community? There seems to be a lot of disbelief that this, you know, that this could be going on. But then you talk to some other residents who say, oh, yeah, you know, those guys bully people all the time. And um, there are definitely some people who have had bad relations with the police department. But it's a small town and, you know, either you went to high school with those guys and they were your friends or you didn't. And so there's kind of a little bit of, you know, there, there, there are many, there are long histories in Calexico. So mm -hmm. everybody's either friends or not friends. An inbred society. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, as we said at the outset, Say that's that. one of the reasons it makes it such an intriguing story. And is, if there's uh, lawsuits and more dismissals, we'll, uh, we'll certainly follow and see what happens there as they shine the spotlight out there. Well, that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guest, Gene Cubison of NBC7 San Diego. Diego, Mario Coran of Voice of San Diego, and Jill Replico of KPBS News. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable. <laughs>